So Amar has organized a day-long hackathon while a high schooler for 20 other high school kids. And uh, he did that um, day long and the kids successfully deployed end-tier Kubernetes apps to Amazon Cloud by the end of the day. So he's not a rookie on the subject of Kubernetes or Edge and uh, talk to him afterward and you can verify that for yourself. Um, the agenda, well, we're gonna cover, we're talking about home labs here and we're gonna cover why you do one at all, how you'd go about doing one and then We've got a lot of it running in this home lab, but we'll do a demo of a few things. Uh, so why would we want to run a home lab? Well, a great convenience of modern life is being able to access your things anywhere on any device. Um, and in some cases, you can host these things by getting, quote, free storage from Google or some other players. But it's fair to question the privacy and reliability of the services we'd have to do if we were to use these kind of free online cloud-hosted services. There's historical precedent for data breaches, price increases, and total service shutdowns, even by the big players. Uh, and many of these so-called free services are paid for by allowing the provider to mine your data for ad placement and other purposes. But privacy and cost savings are not the only motivations for host, self-hosting software. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you got an opportunity to just have fun and play on that production system at work? My colleague William Lamb said this well in a recent tweet. As some of us get older, maybe we lose that sense of curiosity and become afraid to just try stuff out and break things. The home lab is a great opportunity to learn and grow while having the joy of being a kid again. Um, Amar, why don't you take over? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that intro, Steve. All right, uh, so this slide, we've got the header, uh, WTF. I thought this was an edge conference. Uh, for those unfamiliar, WTF stands for welcome to fun. <laughs> Steve wrote that joke. <laughs> Uh, but the headline raises an important point. Uh, why are we talking about home labs at all in an edge conference? Well, there are tons of similarities between a home lab environment and what we might see in an edge deployment. Uh, so as an example, uh, in an edge deployment, you maintain your own hardware. It's not a public cloud. If you want to increase the amount of RAM, you have to put more DIMMs in. If you want to increase the number of cores, you have to change the CPU. It's not just a, a dial on AWS, right? Uh, so the home lab is a great opportunity to learn and grow, while also uh, giving you the freedom to maybe break things, hopefully not too much, right? Uh, the slide here says that there's no 24-7 expert staff with resources to help you out, uh, but really, the slide should say that you become the 24-7 expert staff yourself. Uh, and maybe your family, you know, when you break the Plex Media Server deployment is going to turn to you and say, hey, why is this not working? All right, so first I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the hardware you need to uh, kind of start your own home lab up. Uh, at the most basic, you need a secure network connection, which most of us have at our homes, as well as some compute resources. You'll also likely find uh, some kind of shared storage uh, is very useful for backups as well as hosting stateful workloads. And you can choose uh, for the compute side of things either one big server or perhaps a cl uh, cluster of smaller NUC class systems. These NUC class devices can cost around $500 or so per node. Uh, I think that's a little high, but uh, you can probably get a little cheaper depending on where you look on the used market and so on. And the option Steve runs is a large rack mount server and if you buy this used on eBay, uh, it could be comparable to that single knock in price, uh, but you can really get these things with a lot of specs to the point where they can run multiple Kubernetes clusters using virtual machines. And with either of these options, uh, we say that we should, yeah, you should consider using a Raspberry Pi as an I.O. gateway for reaching non-IP-based devices. And we'll cover more why you might want to prefer a Pi in an upcoming slide. 
So first, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the firewall router. And this can just be based on software running on some commodity hardware. Uh, so two great open source options are PFSense and open OPNSense. Both of these require x86 CPUs. But if you have a computer with multiple network interfaces, you can just load PFSense or OPNSense. The hardware requirements are very low, so you can use something low power like Atom or Celeron. And all you need is some kind of routing software that can support multiple subnets, DHCP server, uh, DNS, VLANs, and so on, right? And uh, another great option is OpenWRT, which is a fantastic open source software. I've experimented with it a bit myself, and it's just a way to supercharge your existing wireless router that you probably already have in your home. For storage options, shared storage is useful. A big part of this home lab is having shared files that are accessible anywhere. Uh, so a st storage solution like Open Media Vault or TrueNAS uh, come into play here. And these can turn a white box at any computer with some drives attached to it into a host for NFS, SMB, S3, and other storage interfaces. And then those storage interfaces can be consumed either by your apps directly or by Kubernetes through persistent volumes. And finally, for compute options, I mean, the compute is really kind of the core of everything, right? This is where your actual workloads, your Kubernetes clusters, your containers are going to be run. And Steve is using an older rack-bound commercial server. Uh, I think we, yeah, we mentioned we could buy one of these for $200 or less, supporting multiple Xeon sockets, up to 200 gigabytes of relatively cheap memory. Uh, the only downside of these systems is really they're very loud and they're very large. Uh, if any of you have dealt with you know, rack mount hardware before. Uh, so really we'd recommend only getting one of these if you have the space for them in something like a basement or a garage. And if you do chose to, uh, choose to go with that large server option, uh, you might want to consider using a hypervisor on top of that server because uh, by doing things using VMs on top of the server, you can run a multi-node Kubernetes installation and that gives you all the advantages of multi-node Kubernetes, including rolling updates, and it's just fun to experiment with. Uh, if you go the, with the cluster of smaller system route, uh, Raspberry Pi might look very attractive, uh, but do be warned if you've looked at Pi prices lately, uh, they are not good. They have uh, definitely been subject to a lot of supply chain issues. So especially for the larger, more recent uh, models of Pi that have enough RAM to run Kubernetes, uh, you're likely looking to pay a lot of money. Uh, there are two options on here that are not listed, uh, and one of those is using an old laptop, and the other is using an older desktop. And I mentioned both of these because really, you know, both Nux and servers and all these like different compute options are just computers at the end of the day. And a lot of us probably have old laptops or desktops that are lying around collecting dust, right? We don't use them anymore, but you can put Linux on them and you know, connect them up to a network and use them to run workloads, run a small home lab installation that way. All right, and finally, to the software uh, that we're running in this home lab. Uh, so I've thrown a bunch of these uh, you know, colorful logos up on the slide. Uh, we've experimented with, I think, almost all of the software that's up on the slide today. And this is, what I should really emphasize here is that this is just a small subset of the total software that's available out there. I mean, the kinds of, you know, self-hosted open source software that you can get uh, range from all kinds of use cases, from home automation to infrastructure hosting to productivity. Uh, to even just stuff like, you know, if you like cooking, there are open source self-hostable recipe apps that you can put up on your home lab and store all your recipes that way, and so on. Uh, so on our next slide here, uh, I'd like to give it back to Steve, who is going to talk a little bit about some of the options we have for hosting all of this software. So Amar mentioned these different types of apps, and where you would prefer to land these apps uh, can depend on what the nature of them are, how they're packaged, and one size doesn't fit all. In fact, I've found that you'll generally end up running 
some apps on physical hardware, bare metal, others inside VMs, some on Docker, some in Kubernetes. And I'm gonna go into how you decide an optimal location for these various things. Uh, I'm gonna race through these and try to get this done in minutes, but there's a lot of these uh, slides here. So um, you want to use, uh, when, when physical hardware access is required, you should prefer to run either on bare metal uh, with an OS or uh, uh, bare metal inside Docker. And uh, this is because piercing through hypervisor and Kubernetes abstraction layers typical, typically requires administrative costs and some can argue that it opens up security holes. You have to run in privilege modes that are generally not recommended by these things. So uh, bare metal is better and uh, doesn't matter whether it's in Docker or not. Um, if a rapid restart after a power outage is important, once again, you would prefer to run on bare metal, either in Docker or not. It just, you don't wanna wait to boot up a hypervisor, boot up a Kubernetes cluster, and you'll typically find that you've got some services in the house that you want up very quickly because others depend on them. You know, if you put up a, an authentication source, for example, your Kubernetes cluster might depend on that being in existence at the time it boots in order to work right. So things that you need to get up very quickly, uh, move, move them onto the bare metal and it will help accomplish that. Um, when an app isn't even packaged as a container, um, obviously you can't use a container. So that runs either on an OS or an OS in a VM. When do you see this kind of thing? Well, some things are designed to run as services or as device drivers. Occasionally, you can be on your bare metal hardware in my demo. I'm on an old Pi 3, uh, which is not a 64-bit ARM, and many open source projects do not package uh, or produce containers for those more obscure platforms. Um, so, um, when would you prefer other things? Um, you know, a one gigabyte platform can still run uh, Docker, but it's not going to run Kubernetes. So if you've got a small amount of resources, you're just not likely to be able to fit Kubernetes onto it. Uh, when the app was made to take advantage of horizontal scale out and you want to use that feature, that's a circumstance when you definitely do want to use Kubernetes. It run it on Kubernetes, it will save you effort, and Kubernetes was made exactly for this use case. Um, likewise, when an app is a complex and tier com composition of other apps, you know, say a web front end with uh, one or more database back ends, Kubernetes is made for this, particularly when a Helm package is available. It's much easier to deploy and update that thing using a higher level packaging mechanism um, and uh, it saves you time and effort. Uh, it helps you keep that thing maintained and patched. When your app needs or benefits from enhanced features like secrets, CI, CD, that you might get out of a tool like Flux, service mesh, pol policies, observability, uh, these tend to be Kubernetes-related features, sure. With service mesh, it is possible to run that in a bare VM, but uh, it's a lot of hard work and Kubernetes just makes that easier. So I would lean that direction. Um, when your physical host gets to the point where it has a high amount of resources, meaning many cores and a lot of memory, say 10 or 20 cores, two sockets, one, 100 gigs of RAM or 200 gig, I would favor running a hypervisor on top of that, whether you run Kubernetes or not. You know, if you went the other alternative of bare metal, it implies you're running a single Linux on something that gigantic, and it might be the only thing you have. You can't carve it up to run multiple workloads if you have to patch or update that OS, take it from Ubuntu 20 to 22 and something goes wrong. Your whole home, everything in there might go wrong. If you carved it up into individual VMs, you have atomic, you have granularity of what you play around with you can even get on a big system like that the ability to simultaneously run multiple Kubernetes clusters, and that can be a great learning experience or something for home-grade productivity. 
So at this point, I'm going to demo a system with that same run direct attached I.O. on physical hardware, which in my case is going to be a Raspberry Pi 3. This is what this thing physically looks like. This, this is in my house right now in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm just going to not pray to the demo gods because it's worked for me all morning and I will all hope I get lucky. But what this is is a very small Pi with a couple of USB dongles. One of them is a software-defined radio, the thing on the, on the uh, lower left for me. That's a $30 software-defined radio. It isn't quite what the telcos would use in a cell tower, but these things are pretty versatile. Uh, you can run things, and I've experimented with this. You have to buy more than one if you do all of these, but I've managed to listen to police radio in LA over the thing. I have managed to detect my car in the driveway because it actually will read the tire pressure sensors and know when my car pulled in the driveway. And it's actually very, it is very uh, secure because you have to provably have those four exact tires show up in your driveway. And one could argue that it's uh, much, you know, very hardcore authentication. And finally, the demo I'm gonna do now is running effectively a home-based FAA air traffic control system. I can't give the pilots orders, but I get to watch them all. And what I'm running is this software stack. It is the Pi running uh, an app that hosts a website showing all the air traffic in the Los Angeles area. And uh, in order to get that out to the internet so that uh, it's visible here in Detroit, this has to be opened up on the internet. One way that people used to do it, the old school, might be to take your home router, open some ports out, port forward them, but there's risks there. And there's some cool new technology out that you might not have heard of called Cloudflare Argo Tunnels. You can get a free tier account from Cloudflare and run two of these, absolutely free, no strings attached. Uh, you do give up some of the advanced features related to authentication and logging, but it really actually works well. And I'm running this open source air traffic control monitor system. Uh, I'm running a Cloudflare daemon on that Pi. It's all very small. The whole thing fits inside that one gig Pi. And I'm also running, I'm not showing it in the demo, a Z-Wave system on the other dongle that does my home automation using Z-Wave radio. And it all fits in that Pi. You saw in the previous picture, it's mounted outside in a NEMA box on an antenna mask, a TV antenna mask, mast. And uh, let's go on and uh, just show that. Um, bear with me a minute because I'm gonna have to open up a web browser and somehow drag it over to the other screen. And just to prove that there's no smoke and uh, mirrors going on here, uh, before my session, I gave access to this URL to Allah over there in the audience, and she brought this thing up uh, to prove that I'm not like just VPN'd into this thing or something. So let me see, is that dragging over there? Good. Um, I don't think that will help get it on the other screen. Oh. It's still here. Okay. Okay, did it go over there? Yeah. I want to maximize it if you can tell me how to hit the right spot. Click. Clicks. Okay, so yeah, let me go over there. So this is literally live Los Angeles air traffic. I think it's obscured there, but it typically at this time of day is showing about 200 aircraft. And it is tracking them all the way down to San Diego and all the way over to Las Vegas. It shows them 
A lot of them parked at the tarmac over at LAX, but it also picks up the Long Beach Airport, the Orange County Airport. It was rather surprising, actually, how well this thing worked, uh, given that it's on a 30-buck uh, software-defined radio dongle. And Amar, if you can try to randomly pick a plane, you can see that this even brings up, uh, I'll coach you, move it over to the left, uh, just press one and we'll hope you get lucky. So th this is going to go out and uh, fetch a actual picture of that aircraft that typically, if you got a commercial one anyway, try a different one. You might have got a private plane that isn't in one of the databases. Lower. Just click one and I'll tell you if you got something. Okay, you got, you got the idea anyway. And then you have to ask yourself, um, you know, this is cool, but if I really had to re remote manage something like this, you know, we're trying to learn about real live device edge cases. What do you do for observability? And um, I want to try to get, if you can steer, if you can somehow just advance that, we'll bring up the observability page that is also coming out of the pie. Well, you won't be able to type. I actually went back and forth. So if you can manage to advance uh, in the order on that thing, the right mouse click, well, OK. I guess go up to the top, and I'll tell you what to type. So it's observability.descendingcloud.com slash graphs. We're giving away the. URL, but please don't open it because if everybody in the room did it, this Pi is literally hosting this website and it isn't, it doesn't have enough memory to have 50 people bring this up at once. But you can see here that these are metrics on the software defined radio. Scroll up and we'll get to the metrics in the Linux operating system in that Pi. We'll see, keep going, we're still on the ADSB. Keep going. Okay. Stop. So we have got CPU utilization. We've got memory utilization. Keep going. We'll get our temperatures, um, disk usage. Um, keep going. Disk I/O. Anyway, it's a pretty rich set of metrics, completely unattended, like you'd see at an edge site. And this thing, like I say, is securely hosted. If you look up at the top, that actually is an HTTPS. Um, certificate on this website, and I didn't even have to put it there because the Cloudflare tunnel is willing to take HTTP, send it down the secure tunnel to Cloudflare, and then Cloudflare puts a, a TLS certificate on it that is accepted. There's no messing around with Let's Encrypt, no renewing Let's Encrypt, and Cloudflare, I believe, gives you their full uh, protection against denial of service attacks. Nobody can even learn what your IP address is for your, your home system. So it's a pretty cool way to harden something you've got running at home. And uh, like I say, you can get two of these tunnels for free. So let me move on to the second tunnel. Um, let me get back to the, um, the presentation here. So the next demo is NextCloud. So Amara was talking about this as one of the apps. This is effectively like a host your own version of the G Drive. It uh, runs Office apps that are sort of, uh, th there's a long history of this project. They call it currently Calabra, but it was based on LibreOffice. And you've got a slide presenter app, you've got a word processor, you've got a spreadsheet. And the storage behind this is hosted on your own server, but you can add an authentication database, put your whole family on, on that if you like, and effectively you're like running your own G Suite. Um, so what's going on here is this is an end-tier app. It has a web front end. 
uh, with a MariaDB backend, and for a cache, it uses Redis. A Helm chart, an official one, is available from the next cloud project itself. So deployment to Kubernetes is pretty easy. Uh, you download the, well, the Helm chart, and if you're familiar with Helm, you override whatever you want in the values file. It does take maybe 20 minutes to deploy, maybe another 10 to stabilize because it starts up a bunch of services that the first time they run take a while. And once again, you can put the Argo tunnel in front of this. And uh, let's see, I've got this running in yet another browser and I've got to find it here. And let me try to drag this one over there now. Oh, by the way, while I'm doing this, Ala, can you verify you were able to get that in the audience too, right? That there wasn't smoke and mirrors here. So this is Nextcloud. I am going to skip the part. I'm, we're, I don't want to encroach on the next speaker and maybe have some time for Q&A. But this shows you what it looks like. If you go up to that icon at the top that looks like a file folder, you can create new files. You can create a, a slide deck, a, an office document, whatever you want. Um, and there are plug-in apps for this in all kinds of categories. So they have hosted this. By the way, they have a phone version of this for Android and iOS, so that if you put this server on the air, you can even get to your stuff from a mobile device. And once again, it's a, it's a tool that you could host in your own home lab. Uh, if you're going to start putting a lot of stuff on here, it might, you know, you've, you've got to host the storage that backs this thing up. But even on a small scale, this is potentially quite useful and maybe gets you back some privacy and you might learn a lot just getting this on the air, even if ultimately you prefer to use one of the commercial services. So, Amar, do you want to bring this home then on uh, the resources? Sure. All right, so yeah, the first resource listed uh, is my blog, so that's from when I was a summer intern at VMware. Uh, there I deployed a bunch of these services in a Kubernetes home lab and kind of blogged the entire process up at homelab.acgandhi.com, so feel free to check that out. Serve the Home is a great YouTube channel that we've linked up here, uh, DB Tech, another YouTube channel. Kate's at Home is a uh, great, uh, repository, GitHub repository of Helm charts for a lot of useful software that you might like to run in a home lab. Uh, but the organizers have recently deprecated that repository, though I believe it does have a new home, at least for some of the Helm charts. And it's still a great resource uh, for the stuff that's up there in archive now. And finally, uh, we've got Bitnami's Helm charts and Kube apps uh, listed here. They've got a a lot of Helm charts, especially for just backend services, you know, you want a database, that sort of thing. Uh, odds are Bitnami has it. Anyways, uh, thank you for uh, listening to our presentation, uh, and we hope that you try out some of the uh, stuff in a home lab yourselves. So, Amar did mention that he was a summer intern at VMware. I highly recommend him, but I was unable to keep him on as a year-round intern. If any of you are working for companies that potentially could take on a year-round college intern, I think Amar might appreciate a landing spot. So go chat with him out in the hallway at the next break if uh, that's something that maybe we can get to work out. Um, anybody got any questions? Or how much time do we have before the next speaker is doing? Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you use what Kubernetes? K3S. K3S. This one is using, actually, I'm running two distros simultaneously. I didn't mention what this hardware is, but it's an old, ancient Dell R710. That was a server that I think first shipped in 2009, but they kept it in production maybe five years. 
and I managed to get this thing stripped for 99 bucks. But it, you know, they sell it to you typically by removing the discs. But it's quite large. It has 100 gig. And I actually wanted to learn about the Amazon AWS EKS Anywhere distro. So I'm running a, a production grade, meaning I use the, AW, the EKS Anywhere thing labeled production, and it's running on there. And then at the same time, I'm running a second Kubernetes cluster, which just happened to be the one that I used the time before, and it is a Tanzu Kubernetes. I happen to work for VMware, so that's the explanation there. I have run Rancher on it in the past, and I have run Microcates. And I'm just kind of the curious type so that when something new comes out, I use my home lab to play around with it to shop and compare. At a break, if anybody wants to learn about the experience of EKS Anywhere, chat me up because I can give you some tips on that, some of the things in the docs. Let's just say they have room for improvement, but once you get it running, it seems to be a pretty nice Kubernetes distro. And um, so not running K3S at the current time, but it could be. And uh, I see no reason why somebody who wanted to couldn't run K3S in their home lab. Does he answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, so I currently have a home lab, but that's running Unraid, uh, which is a commercially available software that kind of manages all of this for you. Um, would you recommend switching? Well, if what you've got now works, there, yeah, yeah. why would you switch other than wanting to learn it? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. I found in mine, one of the advantages of getting like a pretty big server is that it isn't even either or. You, you know, you, you, what you can do is bring up a second Kubernetes just to try it out before you commit and go to not being able to go back. You can do even cool experiments of doing the what if I wanted to migrate. So you can bring up a backup package like Valero, for example, uh, backup your workloads and restore them on a completely different Kubernetes distro. And theoretically that works, but yeah, you have an opportunity to prove that it works. The other thing you can do if you didn't want to do the backup, this is one of the reasons for running that storage appliance. If you used proper persistent volumes, you should be able to detach those from one distro and actually remount them in another one. And uh, if you know what you're doing, there, there are ways that could go wrong. But it is possible to move your, per, your stateful apps over any non-stateful apps. You might as well just redeploy them. OK, if there's no other questions or if you just wanted to do it privately, uh, I'll be here all day, including the reception afterward. We can talk about other apps. We've done a lot more than what you we've shown here. Uh, you, you can play music, including hosting it to play from your cell phone in your car while you're driving around. There is just an awful lot you can do here. And uh, kind of the home automation thing, which we didn't show. Um, I did mention the Pi Run Z-Wave, but there's something called Home Assistant you can use to automate your whole house. And it's pretty cool stuff if you're a techie. Uh, thank you. <laughs>